call to order the Monday, August 19th meeting of the Curry Tuck County Board of Commissioners. At 6 o'clock, we had a work session connecting Corolla. At this time, I'd like to call on Reverend or Pastor Bill, as he is affectionately known, to lead us in the invocation and the Pledge of Allegiance. Please stand. Let us pray. Most gracious and heavenly Father, we seek blessings on the tax before the county commissioners this evening. Bless their efforts with clear insight, their deliberations with wisdom, their work with clarity and accuracy, and their decisions with impartiality. May they use only their God-given skills and judgment, keeping themselves impartial and neutral as they consider the merits and pitfalls of each matter on the agenda before them. And may they always act in accordance with what is best for our community and our fellow citizens of Currituck County. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray this night, and all the citizens say, Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. this time, the next item is approval of agenda under public hearings, item A. I would ask that we delete that from the agenda tonight. Move for approval. I have a motion for approval. Second. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Next item is public comment. Before we start public comment, Mr. Woody, I'd like for you to explain um, item A under public hearings uh, concerning the Moyoc Commons rezoning request. I item A is a rezoning um, for attractive land in Moyoc. It was scheduled for public hearing tonight. Uh, this morning we received a written request from the applicant uh, that the item be continued to a future meeting date uh, in the request they identified September 3rd. Um, our ordinance does allow applicants to defer a public hearing one time to, a, to another meeting date and that is before you tonight and is why you deleted the item from the agenda. Thank you. This time I'm going to go into public comment. Uh, Mr. McCree, you're in charge of the time, three minutes each and I have a whole bunch of people signed up tonight for the agenda item that's not on the agenda. I would just ask if uh, the person ahead of you has said what you'd like to say. It's okay to say I agree with what they said uh, to keep things moving. So this time uh, first is Miss Mary Etheridge. And when you come to speak, I do ask that you restate your name and your address for the record. My name is Mary Etheridge and I live at 846 Charlborough Road. Since the last meeting, the video was not working. I've had several phone calls, people asking me to repeat what I said last, mo uh, last meeting, so I am. My family and I have been involved in litigation with Curry Tuck County since 2011 over illegal spot zoning in our neighborhood. At that time, Mr. Griggs and Mr. McCord were not serving on the board and Mr. Martin was the only commissioner voting against allowing a junkyard, yes, a junkyard, to be located in our neighborhood on 1.1 acres of, that, of land. At that time, not one entity in the county thought a junkyard in Shawborough was a good idea. Not the planning board, not the planning staff, not the Board of Adjustments, not the sheriff, not the North Carolina Cultural Resource, not one person except the six county commissioners voting to put it in my neighborhood. The county's own attorney told the commissioners it was indeed spot zoning and they needed to have sufficient findings and establish a reasonable basis for their approval and they disregarded his opinion. The courts have now ruled in our favor, indeed saying it was illegal spot zoning. So why am I speaking? And again, Mr. Chairman, I do not find this to be some sort of a game. I'm speaking to try and prevent and hopefully make sure this never happens 
to any other citizens of Currituck County. A citizen should not be made to bear the expense of fighting their own government when everybody, yes, everybody said what they did was wrong and was not in the best interest of the public. Even at the county commissioner meeting on July the 15th, a commissioner who voted to allow a junkyard in my neighborhood stated in response to a project, quote, a concern of mine is always the quality of the project put in a community, end quote. Since attending most of the commissioner's meetings from 2011, I can quote one commissioner after another over the concern of projects in a neighborhood and their concerns over noise, traffic, smell, trash, and the quality of the project. I doubt if there's one commissioner, commissioner or a handful of their constituents that would think a junkyard is a quality project. An old saying goes, we all know a tomato is a fruit, but we certainly don't put it in a fruit salad. Yes, I know the county commissioners can approve whatever they want. And yes, the county attorney explains that every time after I speak. But just because you can do something does not make it right, especially when everyone tells you it is not. So try explaining that to the public. Thank you. Next is Sarah Thornton. You're okay. Peggy Lusk. Hello, my name is Peggy Lusk. I live at 140 B Street, Moyoc, and have done so for 32 years. I am one of the spokespersons for the concerned citizens of Moyoc. The commissioners were sent packets to review of our concerns along with pictures of flooded yards, ditches, and roads. Many residents have spent their time and money to bring their concerns and objections about the amount and type of development coming to Moyoc. They have been uninformed since, in many instances, they may not be adjacent property owners. And through the concerned citizens of Moyoc, they are learning how improper development will affect their quality of life in small town America. And I'd like for the concerned citizens of Moyoc to stand, if you will, if you are in agreement. Thank you. New residents to Moyoc and other residential communities need to be given a packet outlining the system of the planning board and the commissioners. This basic information given in layman terms gives a homeowner some idea of how the county government can affect their lives and property values. One of the developments proposed, Moyoc Commons, has had a last minute continuance request by the developer and realtor associated with the development. A lot of people that have come tonight to show their support through the concerned citizens of Moyoc could not be reached to say, don't come since the agenda has changed. We do not stand to gain anything monetarily through development or real estate. But what our community stands to lose is a quality of life. Moyoc desperately needs a family park with walking trails, bike paths, tennis courts, ball fields, picnicking areas, open quiet space within a country setting. If this were considered in the Moyoc Commons area, not only would the citizens benefit, but the merchants would have sales associated with the recreation. With existing traffic and inconsistency of development and flooding problems to date, we have already experienced a decline in what once was a comfortable village to come home to. The small area plan survey has shown residents want a rural country setting. Please listen to your constituents' requests and look to the future of Moyoc with their requests and problems in mind. Thank you very much. Thank you. Peter. <laughs> Peter Thornton. My name is Peter Thornton. I live at South Landing Drive, Moyoc. Uh, safety. Uh, we have a problem here with safety. 
because if we have, and I've been here before, and if we have a disaster down here, we're, we're in a problem. We can't get out of here, even though you get that center lane. That center lane ends at Chesapeake. Now where you go from there? How do we get people to the hospital? How do we do these things? I checked that the train, these train tracks could be very, very, very valuable to us because they can get us out of here in case of a disaster. They can, there's a hospital on Volvo Parkway at 713 Volvo Parkway. It's four tenths of a mile from the railroad tracks. Could we help people? Say, there's a problem. I need medical aid. I've gotten medical aid down here four times. I've rode 16 miles up to Chesapeake Hospital. I know there's any time, every minute counts in my life. And they're willing to help me. But you can't help a person with a block road. Another thing, I was sitting in front of Dr. Olds' office, and one of the response units was coming back, and he sat there eight minutes and couldn't put his lights on to go over into the center lane and get out of there. Eight minutes that truck sat there, he was out of service, where he should be back in service at all times. I did volunteer work. I know what it is. I know how important it is to get to people. Uh, and on the other way, I said about building a safety center down here with a dialysis center and a park and ride. And uh, I think that should be, I think that should be a pool that could be in down there for the kids. And that's what we need here yet before we expand and do anything else. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Ginger Sykes. I'm Ginger Sykes. I live at 111 Mallard Drive in Curry Tuck. $88,000. That's the amount that the Animal Lovers Assistance League donated towards the operation of the Curry Tuck Animal Shelter last year. And we are so grateful for the many citizens in this county who have helped make ends meet and helped us have a very good program at the animal shelter. And another thing that enters in is the willingness of people to volunteer thousands of hours to us uh, to help the animals at the shelter. And one of the main ways that we raise the $88,000 uh, is through fundraising. And the reason I wanted to come and speak with you a few minutes tonight was so that if you were planning to come to the Bark in the Park, which is a fun dog show on Saturday, October 5th, with a backup date, a rain date of the 6th. You have plenty of time to get your dogs vaccinated for rabies, <laughs> because you will need that in order to enter the show. Um, and also, if you are uh, interested in being a sponsor, or uh, volunteer, or have a table uh, in some way, a business table, something like that, uh, please go to our website. The forms are on that. And that's www.currytuckanimallovers.org. And one of the other things coming up on September the 13th, Friday the 13th, those of you who like good barbecue, come see us up at PJ's. A elite thrift store in Moyoc will be having a barbecue dinner there uh, from 11 until 2 o'clock until we run out and free delivery as far from the state line to Barco. So two major fundraisers that support our animal shelter and the things that we do there. And one other quick thing, would like to thank you that two weeks ago you made it clear to I think anyone that was listening that the new animal shelter, and I particularly appreciate Mr. O'Neill's thoughts on this and saying this a couple of times, that that will be paid for, by the way, by using transfer fees, not out of taxes, not taking money away from any other project, is my understanding. Thank you so much for your help and support with this project, and come join 
enjoy the bark in the park bring all of your dogs and come have some barbecue with us on friday the 13th thank you thank you Dear friends and neighbors of Curry Tuck County, my name is Ann Edge Dale. I live at 209 Puddin Ridge Road, where my husband and I have returned to care for my mother, Cora Lee Edge. My parents purchased this property, and my late father, Norwood Edge, built our home there in 1954. I grew up riding my bicycle on Puddin Ridge Road, playing cowboys and Indians in rattlesnake woods floating homemade boats down the drainage ditch near our yard, having dirt clod fights in the fields that are now quail run, and spending lazy summer afternoons dangling my feet from the old hump bridge over Moyock Creek. And believe it or not, I walked home from Moyock School across 168 from the time I was in the third grade there. I am not so irrational that I believe we can restore Moyoc to these days when it was actually a community. Gathered around our churches and treasured family-owned businesses of the Floras, Pointers, Powers and Winslows, and Creekmoors. And I am fully aware of the inevitability and even the benefits of development. But I am here to highlight some issues and to plead with you to take very seriously the responsibility laid upon your shoulders for development decisions that continue to chip away and, in many cases, drop a bomb on our quality of life. <laughs> this group comes to say that we want to live in Moyoc, not just exist there, making our way through the treacherous, inadequately managed traffic to the seclusion of our homes, where we pull the blinds to block out the eyesores of abandoned and poorly maintained properties, and turn up the music to block out the banging of trash dumpsters, vehicle crashes, and four-wheelers. <laughs> Midday on a typical summer Saturday, traffic crawls at a snail's pace through Moyoc to and from the south end of the Chesapeake Expressway and somewhere south of the survey road. Traffic light may be further. Intersections are blocked to side roads and traffic light violations are a common occurrence that we have come to expect. Woe to ye who need to get to the drugstore and great woe to ye who are in need of an ambulance or a fire truck. Every day presents a challenge of getting our personal mailbox, getting to our personal mailboxes on Puddin Ridge. I stand in the ditch until I can catch a break in the traffic. I dash to the mailbox, grab my mail, and then make my way back to my driveway through the ditch. There are few areas of Moyoc, I assure you, that are pedestrian friendly a quality much to be desired by any community. A significant loss would be any development that threatens rattlesnake woods. How we do wish that our foxes and raccoons and owls could be here to plead for their homeland. Furthermore, this natural habitat serves as an enormous sponge to slow and absorb enormous amounts of rainfall through its canopy of leaves and its roots. That's time, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Ms. Dale, please finish. I, I, she's, she's okay. Just keep going. Please finish up. North Carolina studies indicate that water absorption goes from nearly 12 and a half inches per hour to less than four and a half inches per hour when woodland is converted to residential turf. The Forest Service reports that even a small tree less than 10 years old can intercept 58 gallons of water from a half inch rainfall. Thus the loss of the absorption capacity of the woodland acreage of rattlesnake woods, for instance, would mean huge additional quantities of storm water with no place to go but in our already overflowing yards and ditches. 
visitors to Moyoc ask, where is the town? Sadly, I reply, there is no town, just a hodgepodge, some beauty hidden by the ever encroaching veil of neglect and exploitation. Tourists passing through from Virginia to Dare County don't see their introduction to Currituck County as a desirable place to visit or to live. They see it as the most inconvenient, botched up bottleneck of their journey south to the Outer Banks. To heck with the locals and run as many red lights as you can. Please, dear friends, we beg you, Help us make decisions that will restore our community and our quality of life rather than insult our intelligence, assault our senses, and further destroy the integrity we desire of our homeland. Thank you for your time and your thoughtful consideration. James Sanderlin. <coughs> Thank you, sir. Mike Zimmerman. I relinquish my time. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mike Voliva. Uh, same. I'll, I'll give him my time as well. I have Mike Voliva Gore. I'm sorry, and I have Marshall and Barbara, but I don't have a last name. Oh, okay. You're up above. Okay, I'm sorry. Thank you. I must have forgot to sign my last name. Well, it's Gore over top of the name. Oh, so okay. I was yeah, thinking the, the block wasn't big enough. I got you. All right. As said, my name is Marshall Gore. I live at 102 Mitchell Court in Moyoc, and I have lived there for 36 years. I come to you tonight listening to the other people in this committee concerned about pollution. We, I stood and I listened to people up here and I listened to the people the other night about where all the runoff from this new housing development is going to go. If uh, you would know where I live at, I only live about 100 yards from Shingle Landing or Moyoc Creek as it's known. Mm -hmm. Every time a new housing development has been put in to <clears throat> Moyoc, it goes on the banks of Shingle Landing Creek. If you think where we've built these new homes, they're all on Shingle Landing Creek. My concern here is the runoff. Runoff is a major problem in the United States. There's laws been passed to control runoff. Now, everybody says, well, we can dig ponds and put the water in the pond. Well, the water still got to go somewhere. If it goes into the ditches at the, as they pump these ponds out in the Moyoc area, all ditches go to Shingle Landing Creek on the south side and on the north side. The ditch behind my house goes, comes all the way from Porter Station. So in your decisions to allow more homes to be built where they're going to drain across other people's property, ultimately go into Shingle Landing Creek, I ask that you think about the pollution that is going into Shingle Landing Creek, ultimately into Northwest River, ultimately into Tulls Bay and Curry Duck Sound, which is a controlled area for runoff. So these are just tributaries of the large, the larger body of water. Okay, I thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Does Barbara Gore wish to speak? She signed up as well. She relinquishes her time. Okay. Wendy Shannon. Um, I don't know if it's permissible, but I made um, eight copies of pictures of flooding in Moyoc. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. My printer 
printers. My two printers couldn't keep up. Um, my name is Wendy Shannon. I live at 204 Puddin Ridge Road in Moyoc. I've been there almost 18 years, and I, despite what has changed about the area, I do still love where I live. <coughs> but I am here also to speak about the Moyoc Commons development specifically, but also address some of the larger issues of flooding that I have discovered upon researching this particular situation. Um, just to briefly touch on the notice, if it were not for my neighbor across the street who happens to be an adjacent landowner to this property, I may not still have heard of this project coming. Um, she has proposed that a packet be given out to residents when they come into the area. I would submit that when projects of any size like this are to be brought forward, that it might be nice to send out an inexpensive trifold flyer. The mail, bulk mail rates are not that expensive. It would help support the Postal Service and it would also keep us all informed if we don't happen to have a neighbor who kindly keeps us up to date. Um, two of the things I specifically want to talk about are the public services that will be affected by this development if allowed to go forward. One of which is the schools. And I've called and spoken with um, some of the county of, uh, offices and I've also been given some data. Uh, according to the date of July 16th of this summer, the Moyoc Elementary School capacity is 528 students. As of that date, 474 were enrolled, but I called this morning to the school itself and they've already told me that 10 more children are enrolled and they expect a great number to be enrolled this week as it is the week before school starts. They have low kindergarten enrollment and that is uh, expected to go up. So as it stands right now, there's room for 44 additional students. A middle school capacity has only uh, 625 of that 594. I did not call them, but that only leaves 31 students that can be taken in there without going over capacity. I understand that a, a development cannot be stopped because of capacity, but a moratorium can be placed until the schools and also the other public services can be caught up. And I know that that has been done in the past, and I would submit that that needs to be thought of when approving such developments as this, or any of the other ones that have been most recently approved, such as on near Guinea Road, uh, Cypress Landing, Creekside Estates, um, Currituck Reserve was the old name of the 600 plus housing development near the Moyoc Library. All of these are either approved, pending approval, or being proposed, such as this. And if you even had a tenth of those homes that had two children per, you would easily overflow the schools that we have right now. Traffic is also a big issue. We all know what it's like in the summer, but even when it's not summertime, the light at the end of Moyoc Commons Drive next to the food line regularly stacks up eight or ten deep, and trying to get out of there is going to just be compounded by the 89 houses in the phase of development as it is proposed. Um, another concern, folks may not be aware that the actual address for this property is Puddin Ridge Road. I believe, I'm not certain, that that is because there is an easement between the edge and hall properties that dumps out directly across from my driveway. Um, if that were to ever become a usable road, it would have to take out the trees that are currently there and it would be um, exacerbating the traffic on Puddin Ridge Road, which is now much, much worse as all of these developments have taken place. Wildwood Acres, Blackwater, Summit Farms, there are any number of other smaller groups that have added to the traffic. I know that you're all aware that the roads were deteriorated to the point where they had to be repaved last year, and that was adding about eight inches me as measured at the end of my driveway to the height of the road, which causes further impeding of the water flow, as the other gentleman was saying, on the southwest side of Puddin Ridge, flows across to Moyoc Creek. That's time, Mr. Chairman. Just, she's okay. Thank you. Just <laughs> keep going, finish up. Um, the, um, and that brings us to the issue of the flooding. As the package you can see that I passed out, were just a small fraction of the photos that people were able to give me. Um, I did not make a copy because I didn't have time, but I have a map where I have marked all of those flooded properties, and they're all surrounding this development. There's, you know, a, at least a dozen places 
all throughout Quail Run. Puddin Ridge, right two houses down from where I am, is where one of the major drainage ditches that runs between Quail Run and the empty property just south of the proposed parcel. That is one of the main drainage ditches that runs through Moyak and it dumps out right there at the, between Quail Run and the old part of Moyak Village on the side where I live. And in the big nor'easter that we had in November of 2009, the water was literally rushing across the road. And it's hard to see in the photos, but it's clearly a danger, not to mention all of the homes that were inundated by so many people that are stand, sitting and stood up behind me earlier. There is not going to be anything that can be done about that unless a concerted effort in the entire area is taken to figure out what to do with that water and to try and undo some of the damage that has been done by previous development. The uh, widening of the highway has caused a, literally a dam of water that builds up and I know that everyone that has driven past the food line when a heavy rain comes can see the flooding right in the front of the parking lot. Um, I'm concerned that the attention that is paid to that property now is indicative of what will be paid to anything that happens there. The road at the intersection of Moyot Commons and the turn in front of the strip shop is always falling apart. It's not well maintained. If you go behind food line, you can see flooding on a regular basis, standing water, all these sorts of things, mosquitoes, um, damage to property, all of that is only going to get worse. This is not the place for this kind of development. I haven't even touched on property values, which are not necessarily going to go up for those who live adjacent or very close by. Uh, multifamily is not what we have there. That is not consistent with what is around us. And that is one of the things that is supposed to be considered when you are thinking about what you're going to approve. I do not believe that this rezoning is appropriate for this location. A park was mentioned. There may be other things that could be put there that would be much more beneficial to the neighborhood and more in character with what we want. In conclusion, I would like to say that I thank you for taking the time to think about all of these things, and I know that you do not have an easy job, but if you could consider letting the Moyoc small area planning process continue and come to its natural conclusion and find out what we really want in Moyoc. Also, the stormwater plan that I believe was passed at one of the previous meetings this summer is supposed to have an effective date of September 1st, unless I misread that. I would like to see that in place before any decisions are made on this sort of a situation. I thank you for your time, and I would thank you to consider what has been said tonight. Thank you. Um, we still have a whole bunch of people signed up. I am going to ask people to please try to keep it to the three minutes the best that you can. I mean, we can go over a little bit, but if everybody, it's going to be a long, long night. But we're here. We're here. Uh, next is Cheryl Turner. <coughs> William Sanderlin. Um, I'm just going to take up a few minutes of your time. Won't be three. Uh, it's a simple, you hopefully. Name and address, please. Uh, William A. Sanderlin, and I live at 143 Rolling Creek Road. I'm on the south end of Moyoc. Um, I have a family farm in Charborough. I have a beach house in the Fuller Drive area. Um, we have a problem. We have a problem with flooding in Moyoc, <laughs> and all these people are looking forward are looking to you guys for help, whether it's from the county, whether it's from the state, whether we get out there and have to dig the ditches ourselves. Um, I, like I said, I live on Rolling Creek. I've owned that property for 11 years. In the 11 years I've lived there, um, when I first moved there, that creek was way over your head. If you jumped in, you were swimming. Now I can walk out there, even when the water's high, and walk right across it. That is about four foot of settlement. Uh, from the storms we had just a few months ago, trees fell. I saw the, the state back there cutting trees down. They only took the ones that were on top that were easy to get. The ones that went to the bottom stayed in the bottom. But we definitely have a problem, and we need to get it resolved before we add to the problem. Thank you. Thank you.
Veronica Gubbs. Hi. I live at 136 Quail Run Drive, and I just wanted to make a point that not only is flooding a problem, but the infrastructure in our community is not there. It is absolutely um, no, no schools being built. We were promised a high school by 2014 in Moyoc that has never even been built. Um, I understand that the septic tank, the new sewage plant that we have, is already at 80% capacity. I don't know what you know, else to say. I just wanted to add that. Thank you. Thank you. Now, some of you have signed up twice. If you've already spoken, I'm going to skip you this time, okay? <laughs> um, so, Miss Lusk, I believe you have spoken. How about Jeff Johnson? Did you speak? Okay. Jim Bradford. Good evening, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. My name is Jim Bradford, and my business address is 325 Volvo Parkway in Chesapeake. I'm the agent on this rezoning request, and I'd like to thank the board for their time and consideration and offer that uh, I will make myself available for questions at the conclusion of the presentation this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Charles Ely. I'm Charles Ely. I live at 596 Curry Tuck Highway in Moyoc. I moved to Moyoc 40, a little better than 40 years ago. We never had any flooding problems in Moyoc until they widened the road. The uh, farm ditches and the state ditches took care of water, water drain off. Even the state had prisoners to come out at least once a year, every two years sometimes to clean the ditches. They didn't cut just the bushes down, they dug them out, and the water flowed good. And uh, all of this stopped when the state widened 158. Uh, five of the long-time residents of Moyoc and myself met with the state engineer in my front yard to discuss the drainage problems when they started widening the road. And he told us they were going to send the water south instead of to Moyoc Creek. We all told him that the water flowed north and not south. But the state, in all the ultimate wisdom, would not listen to us. <laughs> they, they tried to send the water south, and it hasn't worked. There was a large culvert at the intersection of 168 and Pudding Ridge Road in front of what used to be Buddy Flores' store. And it was another one down the road where Taylor's uh, do it Center is now that went under the road. This is how I took the water from the west side of 158 under the highway into the railroad ditch. The railroad ditch is 15 foot wide and 6 foot deep. After the state uh, took the covens out in an attempt to send this water south, the railroad ditch stays dry. You can have a big rain and it'll flood, and the Moyoc Shopping Center lot will be 20% of it underwater which the developer said was designed that way, because I don't believe anybody designed something that's going to flood. <laughs> but, but after the rain, you can see the one that was up there yesterday when we had an inch of rain. You go there and look at the railroad ditch, and it's dry, because the water is not going where it's supposed to go. I think all of y'all received a picture. If not, I'll pass them around again. Uh, and it shows me and my wife out in a boat in my side yard. This is the yard between my house and H&R Block. I'm fishing. She's paddling the boat. She didn't have fishing license, so I wouldn't let her fish because she didn't have license. <laughs> but anyway, this water didn't come from the highway. It came from the back of my house. Those ditches overflowed where it was run off on food line shopping center, and it came into the back of my house and came into that yard and flooded that lot between us. The developers say they're going to take care of the drainage, but they never do. The developer to this subdivision, they stated they would take care of the drainage until it's completed, and then the homeowners uh, association will take care of it. 
How do we know they're going to have a homeowners association? Is the county going to police this drain this problem and take care of it? They haven't as yet on anything. It, it, it's not right for us to, to dump this drain this problem on the residents that live there now. Don't create more problems for us. We've had enough of them. Thank you. Mr. Ely. Mr. Ely. Mr. Ely. Yes, sir. You said. I knew there was one culvert that run east to west down there in front of Taylor's, but you're saying there was there was one down in front of J.J. Flores as well? As well. It was a large culvert, and it took the water from the highway ditches and from our yards and ran it under the highway, and it might have been another one south of Taylor's too. I'm not sure. I don't remember. It's been a while back that they took them up. But this ran all the water in Moyot, ran under the road from the west side, under the road to the railroad ditch, and in fact, now when they, my north driveway, all the water goes to the state covering under the road and goes north. South side is a grade in my yard and it goes south. And so that's, there's no covering under my north driveway. It is under my south. When we have the hard rains, the water backs up and comes out of that covering, out in my yard, down that ditch where it's trying to go north like it's supposed to. But it floods, and I got a side ditch beside of my house. My neighbor has one, and they fill up with water going to the ditches behind me, which is already filled up with the water trying to get from. Well, north, north, and east is where that water is supposed to go. Right, it's supposed to go, and the water is always flowing. And you can't run water uphill, and that's right. what they're trying to do. <laughs> and I mean, we've got a problem there. Like I said, before they widen the road, we and, and the state won't come now and cut the road in half and put a big cove on the jugging in there so that it can go under the water where it's supposed to. But the next time it's a big rain, look at the railroad ditch over yeah, there. It's dry. It's dry. And that's where the water was intended to go because it's going to go toward the creek. That was the natural flow. That was the natural flow and they rearranged now everything south of it stopped up so we get the flood until it evaporates. All right, thank you. Uh, Janet Taylor. Janet Taylor. I'm over in Lakewood one time, thank you. Doris Flora. I'm in Lakewood one time. Joanna Kenny. George Winslow. George Winslow, Carrollton, Virginia, a uh, farmer adjacent to the uh, Moyot. Uh, yeah, w water does flow to the north, but the water flows high enough to the north that it flows south. It flows the farm. It comes into the Lindsay Ditch, got nowhere to go, and it goes, it tries to go under 168 because there's pipe under 168 is too small. When the pipe is too small under 168, the water dams up. And when it dams up, it, it floods at least 100 acres of the farm. Once it's flooded, if it's later in the year, you can't replant. So that money's lost. That crop's lost. Oh, then it, when it does go through under, under uh, 168, then it gets dammed up by the railroad track culvert. So not only is there a problem with Route 168, there's a problem with the culvert that goes under the railroad track, which needs to be addressed. Now, next thing, general questions. I'm just, I don't have the answers to. It pertains to subdivisions. I don't know what it is down here, but up my way, uh, school buses do not traverse private roads. That means the students are left off at the head of the private road on, the, on a commercial, on, on a public road, and the students have got to get their own way down the road to their homes. I don't know what it is down here, whether that's the case or not. What, if school buses can traverse private roads, do you as commissioners have any input as to how those private roads are maintained for the safety of the school buses? Next question. Up my way, we used to have a problem with private roads. So uh, the county decided that all private roads must meet the same uh, uh, construction requirements as the state. I don't know what it is in your subject. Same thing in your, okay, so 40 foot right away meets state requirements. Whatever it, state it, requirement is, that's what we require okay. in our subdivision. At some Correct. point in time. Yeah. The good folks who live in a subdivision who have a private road, or private roads, are going to decide. We've had enough. They get a petition together. They will come to see 
the Board of Commissioners to take over their road system. That will happen. Put that down. George Winslow's predicting, predicting that. It happens now. It will. Ha okay. When they do that, and whatever condition the road system is in at that time, your North Carolina Department of Transportation is going to take that money out, out of the Currituck County uh, road, whatever was in for the road system, to bring that private road system up to standards. No. Nope. No? They require the road to be brought up to public standards Who's, before they'll accept it. Oh, they, who pays for that? The private homeowners. That's good. Okay, good. Okay, in your subdivision plats, does it does it specifically say on subdivision plats that have private roads, all roads within this, this subdivision are private and must be tamed by the homeowners? Is, it, is that required? Yes, sir. Great, fantastic. I'm glad you do that. So my, my, my main consideration now is the drainage, since you've already taken – oh, school buses, do they traverse private roads? I'm, I don't know that I could really answer that right now. I don't – they do. That's good. Thank you for your time. Yes, sir. When, Wendy Shannon. She already spoke? Okay. Florence Scaff. Okay. Marion Scaff. Okay, Miss Dale has spoken. Priscilla Ann Sanderling? Ms. Dale has a question. Oh, yes, ma'am? Just a point of clarification for those of us who are not accustomed to these meetings. Did you, did you approve the continuance of this project? Yes, ma'am. Okay, I missed that. Thank yes, ma'am. It'll be coming forward in a, sometime in the future. Okay. So it's not the third? I think that's up to the applicant as to when they schedule the, the, Continuance. September the 3rd came up already. September the 3rd is not a holiday weekend? Yes, it's the day after Labor Day. Yes. The, the applicants requested a September 3rd meeting, which is Tuesday, the day after Labor Day. The day after Labor Day. Yes. That's the regular meeting of the Board of Commissioners. Are they required to come on the September 3rd meeting? They're not required, but they, they need to set the date so it can be properly advertised. I think uh, our uh, attorney uh, wishes to speak. No, him. Who? There it is. Well, we're going to let you speak again at the end. But unless you're just going to answer that, then go ahead quickly. Very quickly. Mr. Chairman and members of the board, if, uh, if, if it be the pleasure of the board to continue that to, uh, because of its proximity to holiday, <clears throat> to a further agenda, certainly we're willing to do that. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> Priscilla Ann Sanderlin. So y'all are going to get another, another uh, shot at this when it is on the agenda. James Sanderlin. Uh, I've been seeing my dad. Okay. You have another question? Uh, Mike Zimmerman, you've. I can could, see my dad. Okay. Yeah. Mike Voliver did the same. Me, yes, ma'am. We have uh, a Mr. David Deal who is an engineer and has done a study in the past for the drainage please problems. Please come to the microphone, please, ma'am. Okay. Um, I'm Peggy Lusk and I live in Moyoc. And um, Mr. David Deal is an engineer that we have retained for the citizen, concerned citizens of Moyoc, and I'd like to have him uh, briefly speak to what his findings have been, uh, and this goes back to a study that was done in 2009. Um, I don't know if that is going to be proper, Mr. McCree. Well, I think... You certainly can hear from anyone during this public okay. comment time for their three minutes, as, you, as you've established. Um, as you do noted, Mr. Chairman, there will be an opportunity for, for all this to be heard and considered by the board when this matter comes before you for the official public hearing on the application. Mr. Chairman, if I mean, if we could, he's here, and I suspect Thank he's yes. I suspect he's being paid. So I mean, I don't I, object. I was just asking the okay. attorney to, for clarification. Okay. But, when I get done with the, I don't see his name on the list. When I get done with the list, we'll be glad okay. to let Mr. Deal speak. Thank you. Uh, Paul Mann. Paul Montaigne. Okay. Barbara Wilkins. Josh Young. Carl 
Carla Mavin. Marshall and Barbara, we've already got. Uh, Bert Mavin. Did we already call Cheryl Turner once? He did. I defer my time. Okay. William Sanderlin? Okay. Veronica Gubb spoke. And June Rafa. My name is June Rafa, and I live in Cypress Point in Harbinger. Commissioners, everyone. The billboards encourage me to buy local. Oh, I'm not from Mogadishu. So That's okay. <laughs> the billboards encourage me to buy local. What would that be? Corn, cantaloupes, watermelon. Mr. Chairman, gentlemen, where do you purchase your shirts? tie, belt, underwear, or suits. Ladies, your work attire, pajamas, home furnishings, not to mention a computer, cell phone, a new car, a television, a home appliance, a CD, or a vacuum cleaner. <coughs> Do you shop online in Dare County, Virginia, or Raleigh while on county business? I don't know. Our 7 million plus horse farm rural center attract a vent, cannot attract a venue because of its remote location and lack of supporting businesses. That is millions of spent occupancy tax that do not generate any revenue for the county. Four million dollars of our tax money and $11 million of occupancy tax revenue built a YMCA on county land that we received $10 revenue yearly on a 30-year lease. $7 million of sales tax <coughs> revenue built an aviation school on county property with a return of $1 per year. The billboard extols our refreshing business tax rates. The Monty Hall let's make a deal approach has not been profitable to the county. Our children are our future. We are educating them and hopefully sending them off for further studies, possibly to the avionics school. We are doing this with less federal and state funding. The taxpayers have just been handed a 50% tax rate increase. Will those children, our greatest asset, return to Currituck County to manage a fruit stand or one of our no numerous storage facilities? Sales tax revenues and land transfer taxes have been down for at least five years. We have boarded up businesses, unattractive metal buildings, and foreclosed and abandoned homes throughout the county. The ramshackle corridor is not appealing to the tens of thousands of cars and occupants driving through briefly stopping for the restroom facilities. Commissioners, collectively you have served the county approximately 38 years. As our elected officials, you are our community leaders and policy makers who establish a vision for our county. In the 21 years I have resided in this county, I have failed to comprehend that vision, and I am still waiting for that to happen. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> D, and I don't want to uh, massacre your last name, Polo? Okay. Mr. Deal. I apologize for not being on the list. I walked in after the list had been taken to. I wrote you down. <laughs> Thank you. 
Uh, my name is Andy Deal. I'm an engineer with Deal Engineering. Um, four years ago with Quibble and Associates, I was commissioned to do a drainage study of the Moyoc Drainage District. And it is this area that's encompassed uh, from, encompasses the area from just south of the, uh, of the Moyoc Common Shopping Center all the way back to Quail Run and then all the way up to Shingle Landing Creek. Um, the, the, me being hired to do this study happened to coincide very nicely with Tropical Storm Ida, so I was able to come up and see the flooding, see uh, the Quail Run subdivision inundated, see the, the water flowing over the road, um, uh, over um, Puddin Ridge Road, uh, just, to the nor just to the east of, of uh, Quail Run subdivision. And the study, um, what it showed was that we have an, intric an intricate, con um, I'm not going to have enough time to really get into this in, in this context. I'm going to be back for the public hearing. But essentially, we have a very complex drainage system. Um, it's not a simple ditch or a simple series of ditches that are, that are your typical tributary flowing to something larger, flowing to something larger. They're actually interconnected grids of ditches and culverts that fill up. And during a large storm event, you may have a ditch that flows one direction for part of the storm event and then starts flowing the other direction for another part of the storm event. Um, Quail run subdivision in these events is basically acting as a giant stormwater management pond and um, yes. because of, of this interaction it, the uh, any development that's proposed within this drainage area is going to need to provide an analysis that's well beyond our typical stormwater design now the new stormwater rules that the county is passing uh, certainly go a long ways toward providing protection within the context of don't make things worse. But even within the context of those rules, because of the nature of this drainage system, you're not going to be able to know that a development designed fully to the rules, truly, truly complying with the rules, still won't make things worse in the system. Because we're not just dealing with peak flows, peak outflows, we're dealing with when those peaks occur from developed areas. So it's the drainage study that I did is available. Uh, Mr. Doxy has it, Eric Weatherly has it, um, and I would encourage you to take a look at it. Um, also within the context of the grievances that you hear, there are improve, appro improvements that can be made. They are substantial. Um, it's a, the study more than anything else showed that the, uh, the westernmost ditch, which uh, runs between Quail Run subdivision and some farm fields, really needs to be expanded and expanded significantly in a way that would require the acquisition of easements, um, like 40 foot wide easements. And that's a, a significant infrastructure undertaking, but it is something that needs to be done to truly address what's going on in this drainage district. Um, I'd be happy to answer any questions you have, and like I said, I will be back for the, the actual public hearing. And Mr. Doxy does have a copy of that? Yes, and we have it in PDF format, so it can be you emailed. get that to all of us, please? Yeah, sure. Okay. Mr. Chairman, can I ask a question? Yes, sir. Mr. Doxy, or you can tell me, are these state-owned ditches or, or county-owned? Ooh, that is a question for Mr. Doxy. <laughs> All the ditches uh, in reference here are privately owned. Uh, there are six ditches that drain Moyoc Service District, all privately owned. All go to Shingle Land and Moyoc Creek. Uh, the roadside ditches, of course, are all DOT state owned, or at least state easement. But the rest of the major drainage in Moyoc is privately owned. And he, Andy just brought up the point, the biggest detriment to improving the drainage situation in Moyoc is the lack of easements, drainage maintenance easements on these six ditches. They're privately owned. We've already contacted all of them, had public meetings with them. Uh, every one of them, every single one of them, except for Jim Hall sitting right here, who allowed us to widen his ditch uh, to help the Moyoc area, all the other landowners are adamantly against us taking 30 or 40 feet of their field. The only way to get that easement, in my opinion, is that C word, con condemnation, and 
You know, I'm sure none of y'all, nobody likes that word, but to my knowledge, and I've been looking at the ditches in Moyoc for 20 years, the only way to be able to improve the drainage is to condemn some easements. So I just want to make sure that we understand the county has no control in any of these ditches. They're either privately owned, which we can't do unless we condemn, or they're state owned. That is exactly right. Okay. And Mr. Doxley, I'll go ahead, Mr. Idle. Mike, while you're there. <clears throat> I was just curious, uh, Mr. Ely was talking about the uh, railroad ditch. Uh, give some history on that. I mean, I, I, I totally understand what he's saying. I agree with what he's saying. But from your perspective, give us a little history that, of that. Is, is, that a, is that state right-of-way ditch as well, or is that specifically the, the on DOT the DOT right-of-way goes down to the bottom of the no man's ditch, as it's known to become. Uh, the railroad, uh, their easement comes down to the bottom of the ditch, so it's half owned by the railroad. We cannot get the railroad to do anything. It's half owned by DOT. They have said that, you know, just well have said that they're not going to do anything. Uh, Mr. Ely is correct about the culvert under uh, 168 uh, there at the intersection of Pudding Ridge Road, Buddy Floors. It, was, uh, it wasn't large by today's standards, but when it was put in and the lane was, uh, the road was two lane, it, it was only a 15 inch culvert. Uh, and when DOT widened the highway and built it up 18 inches, which is the cause of a lot of flooding, then they decided they didn't need that culvert anymore and filled it full of concrete according to the plans and specifications that I got from DOT right after that. We've had DOT down here twice and they've looked at it and met with all of us and their issue is if the road is not flooded then we don't have a problem and we're not going to do anything. That's their opinion and that's been their stance on every problem we've had with DOT uh, here in Curry Don't Don't go yet. <laughs> they, they, may not, they may not have a flooded road, but they have culpability in the other flooding that they've created by what they've done. So they do have some responsibility. They may not want to accept it, but if filling in those culverts and doing away with them makes them culpable with the flooding problems, as much as anything else. So if what they're doing is causing flooding on private property, then I would say that yes, there is a cause of action that DOT needs to step up to the plate and address the water and not keep saying that they don't have any uh, uh, jurisdiction in it. And I think that's one thing that the Board of Commissioners need to strongly uh, relay to uh, the DOT officials as well as the private citizens that are being flooded. Um, if there's something they've done, then they need to answer to it and they need to correct it. The other question I have for you is, you're talking about a 40-foot easement. What do you, what do you talk, the, an easement and actually widen the ditch, you're not talking about widening the ditch 40 foot, are you? <laughs> At the top of the ditch, yes, we are. There's, there is a canal, uh, if you will, further west down Puddin Ridge Road that was improved some time ago. Uh, Mr. Doxey took me to, to show it to me when we were doing this study. It would be something on that order, um, and not quite as big as, as that. Um, and in using the condemnation term, which it's also something that I'm not crazy about or comfortable with, I do want to point out that these ditches are not just receiving water from the developed area, they're receiving a lot of water from the farm fields as well. That's part of what contributes to this whole problem. There's significant runoff from farm fields and, and there's a significant contributing drainage area coming to these ditches as well. What about the, uh Mr. Ely spoke about the natural drainage going uh, north versus south and draining west towards east. <coughs> Is that part of what you've uh, studied as well? What I studied was what exists as of four years ago. And as of four years ago, Primarily, our drainage is going from south to north. It's flowing um, from the developed areas across um, underneath 
Puddin Ridge Road and to Shingle Landing Creek. Now there is a ditch in the study, it's termed Ditch 1, that runs along the south perimeter of, of the area that, I, that we studied that actually runs in an east-west direction, I mean in a west-east direction. It goes underneath 168, underneath a, a small bridge at the railroad tracks, and then continues on and hooks up with Shingle Landing Creek much further down, down the way. During Ida, we went and, and followed that, and it was actually overtopping, um, I believe it was Tolls Creek Road. It was overtopping Tolls Creek Road, and, and you know, it was already at capacity down the line there. In the study, um, there, was an there is an opportunity to do some enhancements to that, to that ditch to help relieve uh, what's going on here, but the restrictions of 168 and of the railroad are, are significant. And so the opportunity, really, when I've studied it, the opportunity to make real strides in fixing things for the Quail Run subdivision uh, was to work on the, the westernmost ditch in the system. Yes, sir. Mike, you, you and I had a conversation the other day, and you told me about a pump, which is right behind, I think, Charlie High's place. A boat egg. A pump. Uh, that, that it's on a float level and it pumps water out. But that, that is in the Moyot Commons commercial area uh, that drains that area, the right. food line and all the development there, the fast foods and stuff. Right. That is a groundwater lowering pump for the sewage treatment plant that used to be there. Uh, right. It's still there. And it, you know, uh, it's my understanding that it could be brought back in service one of these days or years. So that pump is not a stormwater pump. I know, but my question is this: Can the it rather if we, rather than get into a long legal battle as far as condemnation things like this to solve some of the problems, can pumps be installed to to help move the water? No, uh, Senator, because uh, the state of North Carolina will not allow stormwater to be pumped. I, I will. Uh, Add to that um, the size of the, uh, the volume of water that we're talking about would be an infrastructure project that the county wouldn't want to take on. Got to ask when you don't know. <laughs> okay, go, ahead. go ahead. I'll get you next, Dave. I just one more question, <clears throat> Mike. When you're when we're talking about the easement, <clears throat> forty foot easement, is is that mostly for access or is it for yeah. capacity of water? I, I still not understanding yeah. that. Totally. Andy's going to look in the study here to see exactly. Uh, it would typically, most of it would be for uh, the enlargement of the ditch. Uh, but isn't easement a problem getting to them to clean them out? Isn't that, that one of the issues that you're running into? Uh, yes. Uh, typically, uh, if it's a uh, crop field, uh, as it is on the outside of Quail Run, we can usually get permission to clean the ditch out. But it's when we start wanting to widen it, which the study suggests, that's when we run into problems. People are against uh, letting Given us widen or take their property. Right. Yeah. The, the 40 feet is strictly for the infrastructure, for the ditch itself. Uh, there would be, need to be additional permissions for the access. Got you. Just Mr. wanted to clear that up. Thanks. Mr. Griggs. And that was my concern as well because I understood that to be what you said, 40 foot sounded like it was for the ditch itself. Then you need to have a means of ingress and egress in order to service that ditch. So we're looking at how much, really? Canal. Canal. Yeah. Well, in terms of land that will not be usable by the person it's taken from anymore, anymore, it's 40 feet. But then there would be additional land that would need to be encumbered to allow ingress and egress. Which, um, if you own the land, that to, to his purpose, another 12 was feet would would typically give you enough room to bring in a piece of equipment. The reason that it is the size it is is that the ditch is no longer just a conveyance, it's also a stormwater management feature. It's basically storing water as well as conveying it. Have Thank you. One last question. Where is that water going to from there? It all goes to Shingle Landing Creek. It's uh, the, 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 the option six in the, in the, the narrative uh, or in the, um, in the study is an expansion of, the, of that ditch on both sides of Puddin Ridge Road all the way to Shingle Landing Creek. Um, the study also called for an additional culvert underneath, uh, underneath 
put in Ridge Road, and it's my understanding that an additional culvert was put in by DOT after the study. Two additional culverts were put in under Pudden Ridge Road uh, beside Quail Run. There was one 36-inch 30, pipe there. After Andy did his study, we sent the study to DOT, and they did improve the culverts in ditch number six beside Quail Run to three 48-inch culverts, which really helped a lot. Put a money. dollar figure to all this? I, we did, we did, later. but I don't have, especially for, it's four year old, the, the numbers are four years old. <laughs> oh, so we can trim some off of it, right? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Mike, I, I got a question, Chairman, from Mike. Sir. What's the, um, like in the Eagle Creek subdivision where they have the pump and station where over there by the uh, farm between, I guess, St. Andrews underneath and the Ranching, power line, underneath the power line, that pumps for Rolling Creek. Rolling Creek, does that in turn go to back on the Shingle Landing Creek as well? No. Uh, it, it, oh, Rolling North Creek goes out to Tulls Bay. Tulls. Moyock Shingle Landing Creek goes to Northwest River. They both go to Tulls Bay. They okay. end up in Tulls Bay. I didn't know if it went through that one then to Tulls Bay. Two okay. entirely separate. Thank you. One, one last thing. Just, yes, sir. It's just a 40 foot canal. I mean, you know, we're not talking a ditch any longer. 40 foot wide. To me, it's a canal. Uh, how, how about uh, Department of Water Quality to satisfy everything that you would have to do with sediment control and everything else? How in the world would you ever do that? I, th there would definitely be a, a state permitting process. Yeah. Uh, it's, the, the biggest challenge would be um, whether or not the Corps of Engineers took jurisdiction over the existing ditch. And there may be lower, lower portions of it where it, where it would. Um, Beyond that, in. the state permits, the, the Diener permits are all obtainable. Mr. Chairman. I'd yes, sir. Tell me your four-year-old your four number. Oh, goodness. I, let me see if it's in what I printed out. Ballpark. I, I can't even ballpark it. I apologize. I didn't print it out. It was in, it was in, my, in one of the appendices. Uh, and I, it's a 100-page study. I only printed out the first... 12 pages where <laughs> I have the complete study if you'd like to refer to this. It's <laughs> <laughs> the one with all the zeros. While, while he's looking at that, I'd like to make a comment. Um, I've had a tremendous amount of phone calls about the, of course, the stormwater and the ditches. Um, and we as citizens need to be mindful of what is put into the ditches. A lot of people put their grass clippings, and it's illegal to um, fill the waterways, the ditches, things like that. So keep mindful of that. That is something that is continuously happening in, in all the Moyoc developments. Um, and that creates some of the um, sediment and some of the blockage that we have. So keep that in mind, too, and remind your neighbors of that. All right, Mr. Deal. Wait. We're moving on. I've got a number of 130,000 for just the ditch cleaning. 130,000? Yes. Okay. That's for the, for the ditch expansion, uh, for the entire length of it. That one ditch. One ditch. That's for the one, yeah, that's for the one ditch. This, what I'm talking about really, um, <laughs> The, the big improvements are that one ditch. Uh, it's, I were, the, the study didn't drive me towards expanding the other ditches for a number of reasons. Um, I got the biggest bang for the buck by going to that, what's referred to as Ditch 6, the westernmost ditch adjacent to Quail Run. So you're saying $130,000. I, I thought it was going to have a lot more zeros. <laughs> well, it's, it's essentially earthwork. Yeah. Yes. And, All right. and I didn't get the, you know, this is an engineer's cost estimate. This has not been, uh, th this was for purposes of comparison. That, that's not to me as, as well. Well, that doesn't. Yeah. The, that big, the big challenging cost is in the easements. Yeah, so there's where your money goes. Yeah. Okay, any commissioners have any further questions? Hearing none, I'm going to close the public comment session and declare a five-minute recess.
next item of business is Mr. Business. Mr. Chairman, you were going to have Mr. Bradley speak um, at the end, and he had some comments that he needed to make. Yes, Mr. Bradley, my apologies. Not necessary. Um, Mr. Chairman and members of the board, uh, my name is Jim Bradford. My business address is 325 Volvo Parkway in Chesapeake. As the, as the agent, having just listened to the, uh, to the discussion, um, I, would, I would like to request that uh, the board consider moving this item to the first hearing in October so that uh, my engineering firm can coordinate um, with uh, uh, Mr. Deal and uh, we can put our, our uh, combined thoughts together. On, uh, on the best solution, uh, whatever that might be, and then when we come back having coordinated, coordinated with each other, we can offer the best possible presentation for the board's ultimate conclusion. Thank you. The only, only advice I would give you is you're only allowed one deferral. Don't put it on the agenda until you're ready to be on the agenda because you can't get another deferral. So you need to coordinate with Mr. Woody to make sure that when it's on the agenda, you're ready because it will be heard. Would it be possible then for, uh, if, if I understand you correctly, to um, simply ask that this item not be re-advertised for a hearing until, we're, until we've coordinated, as I just indicated, and then contact Mr. Woody and put it on an agenda? That, that would be the, ideal. That is because I'm telling you, if you schedule it again, it will not be continued again. I understand, okay. and, and my aim is to uh, provide the, the, the most coordinated presentation possible, so right. that sounds good. And we want to make sure you're sufficient opportunity for publication and, and uh, advertisement. So you need to coordinate with Mr. Woody and, and y'all work it out and inform the public. And Mr. Chairman, it does have to be scheduled within six months. Oh, that won't be a problem. But if we ran an additional 30 days to have that open time frame to resolve any outstanding issues, it would be valuable. So November at the latest, but October is what we would shoot for. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you for reminding me. The next item is new business recommendation of award of solid waste services contract. Mr. Scanlon. Mr. Chairman, our current uh, um, solid waste contracts uh, are for five year period of time. Uh, the contract that we currently have expires this coming December 31st. Uh, we discussed this during our budget work sessions, and the board recommended that we place this service out for bids. Uh, which we have done. I'm bringing the results of that process back to you. Uh, one of the things that we did a little uniquely different than uh, what we have historically done is we segregated the house, the door-to-door -door collection, the curbside collection, crawler from the operation of our convenience centers and actually placed this as two separate bids and one single bid. Um, what we have then is, is for, we'll speak first to the curbside and crawler. Uh, we placed that out for bid. We had two contractors that submitted a response to that. The current contractor, Waste Management, has the contract. Uh, the second bid came in from Bay Disposal. Uh, Bay Disposal's uh, financial cost was significantly less than Waste Management, uh, approximately $35,000 a month cheaper. Uh, we have checked out their other contracts that they have with the door-to-door -door collection. Uh, we're comfortable with their ability to provide that service, and it was staff's recommendation that we move forward with a, uh, a, a curbside collection with Bay Disposal. On the mainland, or, the, or excuse me, the, the remaining of the system is the operation of our convenience centers. Uh, we actually had four different contractors propo uh, submit proposals on that. Uh, waste management, the current contractor, uh, was one of the low bidders on that, and it's our recommendation that we continue to move forward with waste management on uh, the operation of the convenience centers. Um, on the curbside, the contractor did submit a request. Uh, currently, we collect on Wednesday out of season and Wednesday and Saturday in season. They're prepared to honor that time frame, uh, but they have asked if we would consider in season a Friday, Monday collection, I believe it was. Uh, we've submitted that to the POAs and the Outer Banks to uh, poll them to see if they have an objection. Uh, the early results are showing that the preference is to keep it the way it is. Again, the contractor is, is, is willing to, uh, to abide by that. Uh, we're also looking at, and we'll discuss with the board, uh, we wanted to factor in on the convenience centers the possibility of closing on one day per week and allow the, uh, not only us, but the contractor to provide maintenance on the equipment and the site. Uh, there is about a $70,000 savings on the contract if we were if we were closed, say, on a Tuesday, which is one of our lowest uh, volume days. Um, and we would like, we'll be discussing that between now and December with the board for your, your consideration on that. But it is our recommendation that we move forward again with curbside collection with Bayside and the operation of our community centers with waste management. And I'll be happy to answer any questions you might have. 
I got a question on the uh, convenience centers with waste management. At the present time, Barco is the only site where you can take a television. Um, I spoke to a couple people about that. Is that Knott's Island? You, you Knott's actually, Island does too. Or you can take. So does Corolla. It, you can go to Knott's Island. You can take if you have if you have electronic product. Uh, Knott's Island. You can take it to the convenience center there, and the Outer Banks. You can take it to the library in Corolla. On the mainland, you take it to Barco. Uh, we've had uh, Commissioner Greg, uh, Griggs has had some folks approach him about uh, looking to expand that service on the mainland. Uh, we've been out and taken a look at our sites. Uh, we have a concern that Moyoc and Grandy, the sites now are, are tight with containers. We're not sure if we can get additional containers in there. Uh, we do feel comfortable that we can put a container in the spot convenience center. Um, so we'll be bringing back for, toward, for your consideration a recommendation to expand uh, electronics collection on the mainland from beyond to just the Barco site. Like I said, I mean, I'm just, I, I'd had that pop up personally as well as I had somebody ask. I mean, if you live on South Mills Road, you know, you got to ride a Barco to get rid of a 19-inch TV that don't work. It costs you about $25 in fuel, so I just not know if that's something. I, I think I speak a little bit to that. I've been talking with the uh, county manager for the, about a week, well, less than a week, and apparently we just had a uh, a rash of TVs that were deposited on the side of the road uh, on both north and south ends of Spot Road, and then there were some, uh, I believe, a, a vacuum cleaner. And I'm just, I'm assuming what's happening is people were going to the dump to throw or discard their TV, were told they could not, and on the way out said, well, I'm not taking it home, which that precipitated the conversation with the, the county manager to try to expand the uh, collection facilities in the county to address that because that's I don't know how you're going to stop the people from throwing the TVs out unless you can catch them uh, doing it so it looks like uh, at least for the portion of of uh, we can expand the mainland collection uh, locations at least with the, at least at the south end yes what about on the north end or Sharborough or something I mean well, again, we're, we're, we, we went out and did an assessment of both the Grandy site and the Moyoc site. Um, we would have to, at Moyoc, we would have to look at transferring out one of the current containers and probably one of the, the <clears throat> excuse me, the bulk containers would have to leave the site in order to make room to put a electronics, uh, and we're looking at that option now. Okay, thank you. Mr. Scanlon, also, um, in the closing, the consideration of closing, we were still taking that into consideration to vary those closings so that not all sites are closed in one day, but maybe Tuesdays and Thursdays in different locations so there's still um, the bulk centers open we, at some point in time, some place in the county. If, if that's the board's consideration, we certainly can look at that. That's, I would like to, okay. that to be considered because uh, one whole day with, with no um, trash disposal, that may be the only day that one person may be off or whatever mm -hmm. to utilize that. Mm -hmm. So that needs to be considered in, in closing. What, uh, Mr. Scanlon, that was for what, for them to do maintenance on equipment? For them to do maintenance on equipment, for us to do maintenance on the site. I guess. Yes, sir. <clears throat> Mr. Scanlon, the curbside, you were talking about it, uh, a reduction in, in costs, the contract costs? Yes, sir. Will that reflect to the homeowners as well? Uh, we will have to go back and make an assessment of uh, if, if there's a cost saving to the total program, then we certainly can look at uh, reducing the fees on it because it, fee, it's a fee-based system. I understand that, but we will look at that. Yes, sir. Thank you. Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. My concern, if people are throwing TVs out because they go and they can't get in, what are they going to do when they pull up to the gate and it's closed if they'll throw a TV out? So I know we're going to talk about it down the road, but to me, I don't think we ought to close them at all. Because I can personally working. tell you as a deputy sheriff for Curry Tech County, I've probably charged about seven or eight people over a 12-year span where they throw it at the fence, they throw it in the ditch. If they throw it on Tolls Creek Road, it gets ran over. Closed, they just throw they it. They throw it on the road. I agree right. with you. I agree with Mr. Petrie. I think that the closing this is not necessarily a good idea, but then they don't well, cost. The <clears throat> sites are closed on half a day on Sunday. So yes, sir. There would be opportunity on that morning to do some maintenance. But I will say the general appearance of a couple of the sites could stand some upgrade. Um and I know that that requires some time to do some maintenance and cleaning up, but some of the sites could could uh, 
stand a little general appearance, a little upgrade on it, in my opinion. I know the Sheriff's Department, if you call them, they will send their, their work crew out to police the entranceway, not inside the fence, but from the fence to the road. Well, I know on some of them, I know on a couple of them in the county that, I mean, as far as like some of it, as far as coverages, I don't know if he's saying for appearance for that, as far as like trees and stuff like that. I know they, they like Talking them to be kind of sheltered. Inside the sites, there's mud puddles from where they need to be dragged. There's sometimes the equipment looks like it came over on the Mayflower. The, the buildings and, and the buildings build, and grounds. In general, in general. some of that could stand a little uh, more intense presentation. And that was the reason why the suggestion of maybe looking at closing one day of the week is to allow that kind of work to be undertaken. Right now on some of the busier sites, you really don't have as much. I mean, we could definitely have to work around it, but you don't have the opportunity to really get in there and work the site. Right. The opening time right now is, uh, what, 7 o'clock? Yes, sir. Well, uh, you know, if you're going to look at maintenance, uh, uh, I don't know uh, – if they uh, did a study to check their hours or anything, but uh, they could use uh, two hours uh, in the morning to uh, do the cleanup and maintenance and uh, then open up at 9. And because uh, I think you will have uh, people coming to uh, uh, the sites, and if they're closed on Tuesday, they'll leave what they've got. And uh, I think uh, maybe you ought to think about looking at that. Mr. Martin, you read my mind. My my suggestion was going to be as we look at this thing. I didn't want instead, that to get out. Instead uh, of instead of instead of closing <laughs> one whole day, close right. two half days and uh, right uh, and get the same amount of time off. Well, I think that's something we're going to discuss yeah. in a in a future meeting. Right now, what I would like to know, Mr. Scanlon, is the total cost of each contract and how it's paid for for the public. On the the convenience centers, it's difficult for me to give you an exact number on that because it's based on volume. Uh, it's how many pools of what type of material that comes out of each site will ultimately determine what the cost of the contract is worth. Um, this is sort of the same with the, the way the contract works at uh, um, Kerala. I certainly can provide you historic information to give you a sense of the value of the contract, uh, but it's hard to put a specific figure to what the contract cost. The, this part of the system is paid for, um, uh, as Commissioner Idlett had referred to, is on the Outer Banks. Uh, we have a surcharge that's placed, an annual charge that's placed on the tax bill that covers the cost or recovers the cost of the door-to-door -door collection. Mm -hmm. On the mainland, we have a, and also a, a surcharge that's placed on the tax bill that covers the cost of the convenience centers. Okay, and it's all paid for within that. No other monies goes to it. To, towards these particular contracts, right. correct. Uh, there is a it, it, these two contracts collect the material from the community and brings it to the transfer center, uh, which is at Maple. There is a cost of moving the material from Maple to the ultimate landfill site, um, which is in, in Bertie, and there is a percentage of the property tax that goes to cover the cost of moving the material from our transfer station to Bertie. So there are other revenues that go in to pay for it, but specifically these particular contracts are paid for user fees. Mr. Scanlon, each property owner pays, uh, what, $110 a year? I believe it's 110 for um, for convenience centers, and it might be 235 I think, something like that, for the, the outer the, banks. The outer, the banks. The outer banks is higher for the curbside. Pick up. Okay. Mr. Chairman. All right. Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm ready to make a motion. If As I was getting ready to ask you for one. Right. Mr. Scanlon, this, uh, this is staff's recommendations, correct? Yes, sir, it is. Make a motion. We approve. I second that motion. I have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, aye. 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 Opposed, like sign. Motion carries. One last thing. The people on the outer banks, part of their fees pay for breaking the trash cans back in. Is that part of it? There are specific homeowners associations that have contracted for a higher level of service with, with waste management. It's not covered in this contract, but they have contracted above for the, for the uh, rollout and rollback service. All right. Next item is commissioner's report. Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman, you got a consent agenda. Hmm. Oh, yes. Next item, consent agenda. We need a motion. Motion for approval. Have a motion. Second. Any discussion? 
All in favor, aye. Aye. Opposed? Commissioner's report, Mr. Commissioner McCord. Nothing to report at this time. Commissioner Griggs. I was going to speak to the electronic uh, collection down in the southern part of the county, but that's already been discussed, so I have nothing further. Commissioner Martin. Uh, heads up, folks. We got kids on the highways and school buses getting started next week. Uh, please uh, look out for, uh, you know, our uh, most prized possessions on the highways. Drive carefully. Mr. Idlick. I don't have anything tonight, Mr. Chairman. Commissioner Petrie. When you see our, our form of government work, it's a wonderful thing. It's great to see everybody out tonight voicing their opinion. Dittos. Commissioner Gilbert. I'd like to also um, reiterate what Mr. Peter said as far as coming out and voicing your opinions and being active in the community. Um, I encourage each and every one of you to come out to the small area plan meetings that we're having so that you can help um, drive that vision um, for the county and um, for MOYOC. The one other thing is Wednesday night, um, the airport advisory board meeting will be meeting, and I've had lots of phone calls and, and information that's being conveyed to me about the airport, so please, I encourage you to show up if you'd like to be at the airport advisory meeting Wednesday night at 7 p.m. in the conference room at the airport. Now I have nothing to add. Uh, manager's report? Nothing tonight, thank you. All right, need a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. second. I have a motion and a second. All in favor, aye. 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 Meeting is adjourned.